I studied filmmaking in the US during the 70s. Recently, I've been doing talk shows on the voiceless dissidents, those that deserve to be heard but are silenced by the corporate media. The Treasury Department of the present Trump administration sanctioned me and my colleagues. I must have harassed them. We continue the show right here from my home. I am Nadir Talib Zadeh on Nadir's show. On Nadir's show. Greetings. Our interview today is with Professor Dennis Rankert, a professor of physics at the University of Ottawa from 1987 until 2009. He occupied the highest academic rank of full professor beginning 1997. However, in 2009, the university dismissed him. The real reason lay in the way he expressed his political views. The media followed him for a decade, and in particular, a filmmaker, Peter Bisterfield, spent 10 years following his plight. The ballot you're about to hear is from the documentary he produced about the professor. See, I can no longer participate in an institution that I've come to understand makes obedient employees. That's its mission. Listen up, folks, across the land, and I'll tell you a tale about a man, and if you read the news, well, you might already know. Higher education was his trade, it was a tenured property he hadn't made until they tried to change the status quo. He tried to evolve as an educator, explore some fresh creative pedagogy, improve his teaching methods as it were. Well, his name it was Denis Rancor, and before they kicked him out the door, he was wandering now on in his field of choice. Well, now it ain't easy to be brave when you're told to breed corporate slaves. It takes a little nerve to raise your voice. I remember the instant when things just snapped, and I thought, I'm just gonna do it. Well, now Denis perceived many forces like corporations, human resources, who were happy with the standard grading system. But it was clear to him as the mud was thick, the dangling carrots from a stick didn't result in students attaining any real wisdom. You know, they weren't actually learning anything, just sort of jumping through hoops and coming out of it all with nothing more than a vague recollection, a large financial burden, and an almost instinctive urge to buy, buy, buy. Well, now the good professor found some ways like giving all his students A's and allowing them to have an equal role. I was thinking, Oh, they could fire me for this. And so the power struggle was soon removed and the learning process soon improved and it seemed he was achieving his noble goal, you know, teaching folks to think for themselves and understand the world around them in a meaningful way. Imagine that, and in a modern university to boot. So that we can concentrate on education rather than obedience. Well, I soon got back to school again, and it wasn't long until the word come in the professor's methods would not be tolerated. Unauthorized course and teaching tools saying Rancor clearly broke the rules was why he must be dismissed or so they stated. Oh, now as over the top as this all sounds, they had Rancor barred from campus grounds, and then they shut down his laboratory. Oh, now strange as this here tale seems, they really went to those extremes and it all made for a mighty disturbing story. You know, that kind of had the fragrance of fascist undertones, which you might call a totalitarian reek, sort of smell like tyranny. An institution that is this cold and this disconnected from human needs is not right. And so we need to change it. The other thing I forgot to mention was that he was an outspoken critic of said institution, and it, I guess my whole point here is that nobody really likes a big mouth. Big mouths are so inconvenient. So let's wish the good professor well, and for some justice only time will tell when this whole big mess gets arbitrated. Well, the 
fine investment in our youth and a higher commitment to the truth will be evidence to Grand Corps is reinstated. That's right, give him back his job and let the man get on with his work. Okay, Professor Rankert, it's an honor to have you on the show. And um, <clears throat> uh, it's good to have this occasion to be able to speak to you from Tehran. Uh, and um, I, I read your letter to the president of the university, and I want to begin with this letter uh, in which you address the president of your university, University of Ottawa, and you uh, object to what they have done to you. And so let's begin with this detail of exactly what happened, and then I'll proceed to other questions. Okay. Uh, so you'd like me to describe uh, overall what is going on there with the university? Exactly. Um, I've had a, a large conflict with my employer, the University of Ottawa, that has lasted since the beginning of the year of the 2000s. And um, well, it's involved me trying to have academic freedom and trying to run my research and my teaching as I as I see to be optimized and to continuously improve it and so on. And for that, I found that I needed to have some independence from oversight by the administration. I needed to have some independence over the curriculum, over the teaching methods and so on. And uh, so as I pushed for that, and as I pushed for it more and more, and I saw a very positive response from the students, there started to be more and more uh, push back against me to conform to what is expected by the upper administration. I was also at the same time very political person, very politicized, and I'm very vocal about my political positions. And those positions included uh, defense for academic, for, for not, not just human rights, in fact, of Palestinians. Uh, and so I organized talks to that effect. I organized talks on many controversial topics in my classes and also public lectures that I would give in the evenings at the university. And this started to create some uh, negative, uh, some complaints from, well, I would say Israeli-minded people and the Israel lobby itself. And so, uh, you know, there were more and more tensions of this type. And I was of a personality that I never gave in. I never uh, would accept the constraints that were, they were trying to impose on me. And this came to a head eventually uh, under a new president who had been uh, a very high ranking uh, political uh, person here in Canada. And he became, he, he was, he was basically sent away because of some unethical behavior that he had had that was in the media. And he went to be the, the ambassador of the United Nations. Then he came back to be president of the University of Ottawa. And he was a very hard nosed fellow and just decided that I think, as I understand it, that I would be removed, even though I was a full professor with tenure and a fantastic research record and so on. So, that was the beginning of a long litigation that lasted about 10 years and which has recently been settled amicably. There's a new president at the university and it was possible to settle everything. So all of the conflicts and there have, there were many aspects to the conflict have been settled. Uh, they, uh, just to give you some broad lines of what the university had done to me covertly and overtly, it's pretty remarkable the attacks against me over the, over the years, even while I was a professor. So for example, while I was a professor, they hired a student to spy on me uh, in great detail and to report on a weekly basis to my supervisor, the Dean of the Faculty of Science, which is a, a remarkable thing that was exposed recently in court and where the judge was dismayed by that the university could do this. Um, and said some very direct statements about that. So they were doing that. Uh, that was completely covert. And this person, this student was taking on false identity to spy on me and so on. 
they also, while I was a professor, it destroyed my very large uh, collection of scientific samples that was priceless. I had unique samples. Uh, they destroyed them all. Uh, they closed, they locked me out of my laboratory. And without telling me again covertly, I only found out many, many years later, they had, they actually destroyed these samples from around the world that were unique. Uh, just to give you an example, I had the largest sample of the remnants of the meteorite that is believed to have killed the dinosaurs, you know, and they just destroyed everything. So that was a new grievance that was filed in, just in, in the recent last two years. Um, they also secretly uh, had a psychiatrist do a profile of me without interviewing me, without my knowledge, covertly, based on hearsay evidence provided by my supervisor, and to write a report, and that report was sealed. I was never allowed to see it and used against me. So that is the only remaining thing where I'm, it, everything with the university is settled, but I'm continuing to pursue uh, disciplinary law against this psychiatrist who was from out of province who came to do this. So that is still uh, an active litigation that I'm involved with, but everything with the university itself, they also funded a large defamation lawsuit against me. They spent over a million dollars suing me in court for defamation. Uh, but, but everything's been resolved now. Uh, but it gives you a sense of the scale of the attacks against me by my employer at the time. Uh, I, they, they, not only did they fire me, but they wanted to silence me completely and to punish me, I think. So uh, that, that has been the nature of that struggle with the university, which I'm happy to say is now completely re resolved and was resolved very expertly with the help of a mediator. But it took 10 years and my union was uh, supportive the whole time and uh, I got great, you know, legal support and so on. But it took 10 years to resolve it. Yes. Right. Okay. You were aware at the time of the sensitivity of the issue of Israel and any criticism of Israel. Uh, could end you up in uh, the, the mess that you ended up with and it took a decade to clear out. Um, um, but, but being aware, you went on and did it anyway because you felt something has to be known about what's going on, the new trend. Can you explain about that decision to go well, on and, anyway? And I did it in a very visible way. I actually invited Palestinians into my classroom to come and talk about the conditions that they had experienced in, in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip. And this was in the largest auditorium on the campus. And uh, it was announced and I, I made it very public that I was doing this. And so I did those kinds of things. So I had very controversial speakers on a whole array of controversial topics. It wasn't just uh, uh, Israel and Palestine. Um, and I would also, I also ran a, uh, at the time, this was popular film series every week at the university in, in the, uh, in a large auditorium in the physics department, which were films about social justice and about conflicts in the world and so on, where I invited, for example, I invited a Jewish filmmaker who had made a film about Israel and about Palestine. And that was very critical of the Israeli system of apartheid and so on. Uh, so that was something that I did regularly uh, through film, uh, through speakers and so on. And and of course, um, there were uh, letters written to my to the president of the university. There were uh, negative comments in the media. There were colleagues who uh, felt they should uh, defend the Israel lobby and who made very vocal uh, statements against me personally and against uh, the positions that I was uh, trying to make public so that people could discuss them thoroughly. There was a lot of conflict that, that related from that, yes. And there was an attempt to discipline me at the time about uh, these complaints uh, coming from the Israel lobby perspective, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Were you also accused of being anti-Semite? I was, you know, that's one of the things that has, I've never been accused directly of being an anti-Semite. Um, I think that, I suspect that people know that I would very, be able to defend myself very well. Um, 
Um, and and often the the attacks against me by the Israel lobby were never direct. They were always through people, um, through student groups or through, you know, the, the, the Israel lobby came into my classroom one time. Uh, the, 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 the Israeli Association of Students, uh, several of them came in just to intimidate one of my speakers that they didn't like. And uh, we're, we're, you know, acted in an intimidating way to, to achieve that. Um, so things like that would happen. Uh, but I was never, I was, I was attacked generally as, as being a, an unreasonable troublemaker. But I was never called an anti-Semite, no. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, do you know the plight of what happened to uh, Professor Anthony Hall? Oh, yes. I'm well aware of the, the case with uh, Professor Hall, yes. Because uh, Professor yeah. Hall was our, yeah. was our guest in Tehran at the New Horizon Conference a few years back. When he went back, he was one of the first to be persecuted, uh, to be laid aside, and he had to have a whole case. Well, I, I don't know that he was one of the first uh, because there have been there's a long history of this kind of persecution. The the one that I'm maybe most familiar with is the case of uh, David F. Noble, who uh, was a who's a very famous historian of science and technology. He's now passed away. He was a good friend of mine. Uh, he was a full professor at uh, York University, I think the largest university in Canada in Toronto. And uh, he was extraordinarily critical of the Israel lobby's control over the university and uh, very, very talented at making that point and doing the research that was relevant to that. So there was a decades of conflict between him and the university in relation to that, including all kinds of things. Uh, concerning yeah. Professor Hall, just because I just I know him. Sure. Yeah, sure. Can, can you make some comments about his case and what a, did you have any discussions with him? Yeah, I, sure. I've discussed with him. I discuss with many, many professors who are persecuted by Canadian universities. Uh, I have I, I, I make a point of reaching out to them and chatting and so on. And, and they will often reach out to me before I get a chance to. Um, so, yes, I'm aware of, of his case. And I think it's absolutely egregious the way that they broke the law in order to discipline him and suspend him and and attempt to fire him and so on uh, for a for a university to not bother with the law and to just behave like a bully in that way as an administration is absolutely uh, stunning and egregious. And um, I actually wrote a very strong criticism of the administration at the time that I made public, uh, which itself got me into trouble, I believe. So anyway, yeah, no, that I'm aware of that case, and um, I don't understand how university administrations can get away with this. Uh, they're powerful. They have uh, lawyers and funding. They're an institution. So it's very hard for one's union to, to defend you effectively when they have the backbone to do so. Uh, so, so Professor Hall has been very brave throughout this and uh, was very tenacious and managed to, as I understand it, he managed to settle uh, an agreement, uh, which is to, which is to, uh, that he appreciates and gives him, he still maintains his freedom to communicate and to do the, the, the research and the publication work that he does. Yeah. Would you say, uh, Dr. Rankert, that the university realm in, in the social uh, um, medium that we have uh, is, is the front line of any criticism toward Israel where there is a battle and uh, in, in other areas maybe nobody dares to, to criticize Israel and other realms uh, but the university once in a while you have professors you have scholars who would stand up and that would create a chaos well it it I think once in a while is the operative term here. In other words, it's not the front line. I don't believe it is. Uh, yeah, academia is very sedate and very obedient and very well disciplined uh, and very indoctrinated. So the great majority of academics are just what I would call service intellectuals. That's a term that I uh, developed in an early essay long ago. But um, they, uh, no, they're, they've, 
through the tenure uh, acquiring process, they have become very obedient service intellectuals. They're 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 completely uh, accept the ideology of the system and of the institution, and they protect it. So the universities are not the front line, but there are some resilient people who have. Uh, um, uh, you know, kept their independent thinking and who um, are outspoken. And yes, they do get into trouble, but they only get into trouble uh, through two ways, either because they're, they're seen as a threat, a real threat by the Israel lobby, which will then put a lot of resources into uh, defaming them and discrediting them and attacking them and, and make, trying to get the, the institution to fire them. That's one way that they get into trouble. The other way they get into trouble is um, to be targeted on some superficial thing like they the, a blog post that you know that they do and the, the Israel lobby typically benign breath will go crazy on the fact that there's something about this blog post they, that that they can latch on to as being completely unacceptable and a sign that this must be an evil person or whatever an anti-semite and so on um, so there there's the the very um, so they, 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 yeah, they, they do make examples of people if they can find something in social media to grab onto. Um, and uh, the other way is more covert. They just won't put you on big committees. They will uh, exclude you from the levers of power, if you like, within the institution, you know. Um, so there are, there, there's an array of, of methods for outspoken people who are saying things that disturb and that are not aligned with um, the the overall, I would say, even geopolitical goals of of the country. You know, uh, yeah. Okay, um, I want to know how much do, do the youth? I mean, um, as you yourself were studying and going through college, um, and um, did you anticipate? that the future will bring this sort of a scene in which there will be a reality and that reality could not be criticized on campus. And you just have to hush up. No, of course, I was very naive as a, as a young student. I'm, you know, I'm from the working class. And so I accepted the naive notion that there was academic freedom, that the intellectuals could research and discover and communicate and and that the university was a place where you could do that. So I was, I was, I did not have uh, family knowledge of how these institutions operate, and I was very naive. And I entered, I entered, I, I you know, the, the deal I made with myself is, I will do everything to acquire positions so that then I can have this wonderful freedom to research and to think and to discover things. Um, so I didn't expect that there would be, I, I was surprised every time there was uh, resistance to what I was trying to do, I was authentically surprised. I, I, I couldn't understand why my supervisors would ask me to use a different book in my classes or uh, not, not use certain material or stick to their vision of what the curriculum was and so on. By the way, I was twice disciplined because the university claimed that I was subverting the curriculum, okay, that I was not following the curriculum. I was twice disciplined for that, including one time where I was, it was part of the reason that they fired me. And both times, two different arbitrators, uh, you know, uh, tribunals, uh, ruled that I had absolutely not subverted the curriculum, that I was following the curriculum, that there was no evidence whatsoever that I had subverted the curriculum. So this notion that they kept saying, and uh, you know that I was that I was doing academic squatting and subverting the curriculum and everything like that. I did use the term academic squatting to to express how original what I was doing was, but um, they have failed to prove that at the tribunal level twice. So there is there, there that is that is something that still people say about me. You know the the. The, the, even the Wikipedia article about me says that I practiced academic squatting, which means that I subverted the curriculum and so on. It's not true. It was proven in, in at tribunal level that that is absolutely not true. 
So, yeah, they, they were doing these kinds of things. And I was surprised every step of the way when, you know, one time the dean barged into my classroom, a large classroom full of first year students at the beginning of the term and explained to the students that they were that I was not following the curriculum. He 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 just based on things he saw on social media and so on. He explained to the students that therefore I would need to be replaced if need be to the to the class. I mean, I, it was stunning and um, it was shocking. And so l luckily the students uh, were very independent minded in those years and they turfed him out of that classroom so quickly. You know, they basically they started asking him questions. They stood up to him and he was embarrassed and left the classroom walking backwards in fright. Um, and then that became a media a media event, the media talked about it and so on, and the students won that the, they would not interfere with our course that year. Well, that really upset the administration that they would that they would embarrass themselves like that. And so that was that became part of the reason that they didn't like me, you know? Yeah. So there there was years of these kind of battles, yes. Um, you know, I I I know that Canada follows the US. Um, and um, the US has certain very imperialistic policies towards the whole world in, in a very arrogant way. Um, well, they're not just policies, they're practice, imperialistic practice. And it's, 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 it's an empire and it's based on intimidation and extraction of resources, continuous extraction of resources uh, and, and, and wealth and control of the instruments that uh, produce wealth for themselves, you know, it's a one way conveyor belt, basically, and they are at the head of that. So it's more than just a policy, I would say. And uh, one of the questions that hits me is a student is uh, always questioning, especially those years, sensitive years, 18 and up, and they see a professor and they see a world and they have also access to a lot of uh, news, alternative news. They can go to different sites and find out. This is a very unique opportunity in history today that we, we all have in the world. And I'm questioning how much do the students feel the censorship, the siege? Well, you know, something that the uh, non-Western world or non-North American world does not understand fully and does not see and has not experienced and that is very real here in Canada and the United States is the degree to which students have been clamped down upon regarding their minds and their own academic freedom. Uh, the institution of education has been transformed in in, in parallel with the increasing globalization that has occurred, has been transformed to gut the professional independence of all teachers, primary, high school, college, university, so on, and has created this environment in the school, which is more, even more than before, like a prison, where there is a standard curriculum that is simply delivered. There is no room for discussion or thought or exploration or student-centered learning or anything like that. So there, I actually go through the history of how that occurred in, in several of my articles in Ontario in particular, the Canada's largest, most populous province. Uh, and there, there has been a systematic, uh, I would say, killing of the educational system in order, which the result of which is that students who come out of high school are no longer able, are not independent thinkers. They are basically asking to be obedient and to be given tasks that they can follow in an obedient way. More than ever before, that is the truth now. So I was, I was, I saw that transformation while I was a university professor. I saw the, the, the what the students were like in the 80s, and then I saw what the students were like uh, later in the late 90s and so on. And uh, there was a huge transformation where the students became these uh, basically zombies who could sit and watch PowerPoint presentations instead of uh, demanding that they understand things and understand and, and be demanding of their professors. So 
we're at a stage now where, where young students, even though they have access to the internet, even though they have all these incredible resources, uh, the ones that want careers and that are in the university system are extraordinarily gutted in terms of independent thinking. They've become, so, they've become timid. Uh, yeah, timid would be a generous way to say it. I mean, they, they have really been structured in a way that they uh, adopt and protect the ideology of the system and just want to obey because they see that as the only way to survive and have meaning in their lives is to be obedient and to follow the career path. Uh, so they don't see it as a way of expressing themselves. Instead, they see it as um, an obligation to follow the rules. There, there, there really is a kind of, it's, it's hard to perceive, even here when it's happening slowly over decades, it's hard to perceive among ourselves. But this has happened in North America to, a, I believe, a greater degree than anywhere else, uh, because the empire cannot afford to have its citizens uh, uh, be anything other than obedient and indoctrinated. And they have chosen this very fascistic, Path, which is to destroy the educational system and make it about constant testing, constant grading, constant evaluation and obedience uh, demonstration by the students, instead of about uh, developing independent thinking professionals, develop independent thinking uh, citizens that will love their nation and that will want to do good for their community and their nation, but through independent and creative work. At, where they have some liberty to do so. And I think that that is the model, as I understand it from my study, that's a model that is successfully being applied, for example, in Russia, where uh, you know there is a great pride in profession and in professional schools, but there's a, a pride that these professional schools have a broad education and encourage people to have perspective and to have um, creativity in advancing the nation, uh, that has been removed. Basically, what you have is um, the empire wants managers that manage the globalist empire. And so they want people who are willing to be um, exploiters and who are willing to work within that. And they will be cantonized. They will have special privileges. They will be very wealthy and have very high salaries and they'll be in a world apart. So there is a division, there's a very strong class division that's being created between uh, you know, the managers of the global system um, and everybody else, the working class, the, the non-managing lower classes and so on, which is why you have uh, the Trump phenomenon, uh, the gilet jaune in France, uh, the Brexit phenomenon, is because there has been this division that's been created between the managerial class of the global system in the West and the everybody else that is being uh, left behind, and but that is being subjected to these horrible conditions in education and in uh, public health and so on. They're 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 being subjected to the brunt of this globalization even at home in the in the empire. Okay. Um, so you, you create a, a destabilization even of the empire from within by your choice of how you are going to achieve more globalization and more exploitation, okay? So you've gutted the educational system, you've gutted professional independence, you, teachers have become overworked, there's no preparation time, there's no professional development time, they're just delivering content. The students are forced to be obedient because you can't, you don't have time to think about anything else. Um, you know, I could go on for hours, but I visited a primary school not long ago. And honest to God, here in Canada, in Ottawa, in the capital of Canada, it was like entering a prison. There were prison guards at the door. There was a lock on the front door. I was invited by a teacher to come and meet the students. There were people lined up being screamed at, little students, you know. Um, they're being treated like animals. And uh, they're, they're, the, the teachers are like sergeants or something, you know, drill sergeants. It's just absolutely unbelievable. So this is the society that has been created and that I think has been destabilized by this choice. 
okay? Um, I see it as a kind of corporate fascism. That it, when, you, when you expect people to just be obedient and to lose their ability to be creative and to participate in a creative way uh, with your human uh, independence and so on, and you, the system is designed that way, I think that is a sign of what I would call fascism. I, I mean, I, I think we can't be afraid to use the word, you know. And you see the very negative effects of this, even in families. I mean, if I walk in the park and I see families um, of this class of individuals, the student, the, the, the children in the parks are being told what to do, what not to experience, to stay away from uh, you know, the brushes because they're dangerous to not go into the water, to not this, to not that. They're constantly being given directives on how to feel, how to be, how to everything. Um, the only place where I see natural families and happy children are in the, 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 the more immigrant kind of uh, environment. So if I go to a festival or if I go to the part of the park that's closer to the high-rise buildings where they're, they're more immigrant and uh, mixed families, uh, then I see children who have freedom to make up their own games, to play around, to, to, to uh, you know, to decide together how they're going to be devious uh, regarding parent, parental rules and so on. They're not isolated. They're not being told every minute how to be and how to feel. So I see a real destruction of my country uh, through the choices that are made by government in response to the big driving force, which is globalization and increased globalization. So I wrote a big paper about this recently, trying to explain how the, the biggest gear in the system is this uh, empire's uh, absolute requirement to exploit and to control the world, how that, which is called globalization, how that drives everything else. It drives restructuring of the institutions, it drives uh, how the, the media environment, the mental environment, it drives what are the state religions, the state ideologies that we're going to believe in. One of them is uh, uh, global warming and CO2, okay? I did the history of how that state doctrine came into being directly tied to uh, acceleration of globalization that occurred after the fall of the Soviet Union, okay? And how the United Nations uh, coordinated that and so on. I, I did a large paper to explain that. Um, um, and it sounds crazy because it's such a state religion. For me to even say that, some people just turn off. As soon as they hear that I'm questioning uh, the science of climate, which, <laughs> you know, I'm a scientist, uh, they, as being a state doctrine and as being something that is used to turn our attention away from, from the real problems and to align us with a mission which is to save the planet uh, as as you would align any people using a state religion um, i sound crazy in the, in the present environment in the western world you know uh, to say those things but i have studied it at great length and i've written uh, one of the, one of the largest articles uh, where i studied this and explained how it came to be um, I, is that it's entitled uh, Geoeconomics, I'm reading it here, Geoeconomics and Geopolitics Drive Successive Eras of Predatory Globalization and Social Engineering. So the social engineering is fairly novel, how I explain how that comes to be and, and, and how that is put into, built into society as a whole. So we don't realize in the West the degree to which our very... Um, mental environment and the things that we're brought to be concerned about as the middle class and the upper middle class and so on, how that is brought in by design, how it's there, there's a use of institutions, there's a use of the educational system, there's a use of the mass media, and there's, and this is done by design top down. And we don't realize the degree to which this is true. I mean, I uncovered some incredible research, for example, when the uh, when the elite financiers decided that they could really make a killing uh, with a, a cap and trade regarding carbon, and they decided that they were going to give that a shot, the media 
worldwide, all the influential means, mainstream media acquired a positive uh, reporting of global warming and climate change suddenly in the mid 2000s and it was turned on all at the same time simultaneously the coverage in these newspapers uh, increased fivefold suddenly everywhere it's a spike it's incredible and this was at the same time that the that the film uh, by Al Gore was being put out inconvenient truth um, so and you know, these people like Al Gore and so on, they're all in, involved and, and have interest in these investment companies that are going to profit from this. So you have financiers who are being given free reign as part of the increased globalization, who are to, who basically given free reign to exploit, who see these scams and who will take advantage of them because they're all potentials to strengthen the US dollar. If you start trading um, carbon, on the global scale and it's valued in US dollars, you've created one more tie to valuing the US dollar and to keeping it as the world currency, which is the main mechanism of exploitation in the world by the USA is the US dollar. So everything that you can uh, force, all the important vital com commodities that you can force to be traded in US dollars, oil and energy in particular, but also opium, Afghanistan, and so on. Anytime you can do that, um, you are locking in the US dollar as the world currency, and therefore you have complete control of the system through this mechanism, uh, which involves economic sanctions, economic control, blockades, and so on, and which involves a conveyor belt through printing money, of extracting resources at ridiculously low prices, uh, um, from from anywhere you want and being able to therefore fund a bloated military which then enforces this very system. Uh, so there's much evidence of that and in the paper that I just uh, cited there, my paper, I explain all of that. It's, it's, it's a large paper, some 80 pages, um, but I try to explain how that works, yes. Uh, Professor, thank you so much. I appreciate it. We've started running out of time. Uh, but uh, it was it was great uh, uh, talking to you about this, especially when you continued on with different issues that I should have brought up by your articles, but you mentioned uh, very well. Uh, I think it covers very well the the dilemma. Uh, I hope uh, I wish you great success, and uh, despite everything, and I hope that the the future will be a brighter future for all of us here on this side and you on the other side. Uh, some, there's a great deal of uh, demons in the world today. Uh, it's a difficult world, but I'm, I'm glad that at least we have the chance to be able to communicate with you. And I hope that my audience will be able to make good use of uh, this talk with you from this side of the world. All right. Well, it was a pleasure being with you. Uh, I, I really appreciated it. And uh, I appreciate, well, I could, I could go on about how I appreciate the nations that are resisting and that are uh, have have real identity and backbone and who who are basically saying no you can't do that here yeah, the, yeah. Our, our country i think is proud about that yes <laughs> okay 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 take good care and i'll see you all right you okay take care bye bye now bye 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 take care Heidi Malin. Thank you for watching the show. See you soon.